Mr Chair. Chair. Mr. Chair. Call Denise Roche. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to take a call on part two of the Health and Safety Reform Bill. Sir, um, this is the part of the bill that talks about um, persons conducting a business or a unit, PCBUs, which we are using a lot tonight. And so I'm sorry if anybody's just tuned in and gets to hear PCBU and doesn't know what it means. Um, and this section talks about the key principles relating to duties. In this uh, part, I've actually got a supplementary order paper because um, within this section, sir, I, it's kind of where you start to see um, employment law and civil law or uh, criminal law start to get mishmashed up. And I refer particularly to the section, uh, I think it's my SOP actually, um, uh, which is Clause 29E, um, which is around the whole issue of where PCBUs are negotiating with other PCBUs on a work site. So, for example, we've got um, the port companies um, who have got contracting companies on there. They've got, uh, you know, sort of other companies that are being used up potentially undercut some of their directly employed um, stevedores, um, and you've got a range of people operating who are all, um, who are all employers, who are all PCBUs. And the, there's a part in this section of the bill which talks about how PCBUs kind of operate together. Um, and I think it's quite important that they do manage to talk together quite effectively so that the whole place um, develops a culture of workplace health and safety. For example, um, because otherwise they can, uh, they can sort of neglect their duties. They can say, no, it wasn't my fault that this terrible thing happened. And in fact, so during the health and safety reform bill submissions, we did have one um, organisation say that when I questioned them about the fatality rate that they had at their port, and they said, we have a clean slate. And I said, I can show you the, 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 the releases about this. And they said, it wasn't us. So we support the fact that this bill is designed to get those persons conducting a business, in a un business unit to talk to each other. And I guess what my supplementary order paper is attempting to do is to get those PCBUs to talk together and to negotiate with each other in good faith. Now, good faith is a, uh, it's a concept that's used in employment law, but I was told that you can't have it, you can't possibly have it in this bill, because, in this, in this context, basically because it relates to two commercial operations, not the employer-employee relationship. So I understand that. So what I wanted to see, though, was a test of that type of good faith that could operate um, in negotiations and information exchange between PCBUs. Because essentially what we're trying to do is set up a work site where there are fewer risks across all the different employers or PCBUs operating there. And so what I've suggested is that in uh, 29E, uh, we require um, that uh, Persons undertake, um, conducting a business or undertaking have a duty in relation to the same matter to consult and cooperate with and coordinate activities with other PCBU who have such a duty, and so they must deal with each other fairly, be active and constructive in discharging its duty, and not do anything to mislead or deceive the other PCBUs. So I would have thought this was fairly reasonable, and I would be interested to hear from the Minister why he hasn't adopted this very reasonable supplementary order paper. I'm also interested to, um, to go through some of the supplementary order papers that the Minister has brought to the House very late, uh, but today. And one in particular strikes me as quite interesting. There's a couple of good ones here that we probably will be supporting. But the one that, um, uh, that I have questions around 
is the one around, uh, and the speaker on the National Party, the earlier speaker, said, started to talk about it, which was this whole issue of dwelling. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Denise Chair, Roche. Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's the whole issue of the main dwelling house on the farm that that is excluded, and this is the SOP from sorry, this is the SOP from the minister, um, which says. That I'm just trying to figure it. Government SOP. Uh, it refers to clause 32, 1 1B. B, yeah. subsection B. Um, and what that essentially says is that um, the main dwelling of a house on a farm is excluded from uh, from basically being a place of work. However, sir. Further on in this part, there is a whole section about fixtures and fittings of the plant and workplace. And so the question I have is, in a situation where the farm, the person who lives in the main dwelling does not own the farm, uh, but is employed to run the farm, and the main dwelling is substandard, it has electrical faults, it has uh, it has all sorts of problems with the plumbing. It has rotten floor floorboards. And it is the main dwelling. Then what happens then? We do have situations in this country, sir, of very, very substandard housing. And if that is part of the employment package for the person who is employed by the landowner to run the farm, and so it is part of their employment relationship, it's, an, it's part of their agreement, it's part of their conditions of work. Essentially, it's, it's one, of the, one of the ways they're being remunerated, supposedly. Why is that exempt from any kind of protection under the health and safety and employment law? Particularly if you consider this may be a worker who's on like 24 hour call. Why then? Is in this situation, they're exempt, and so I would be, I would welcome the minister's comment about that because this is a new part of uh, of the bill which he's suggesting that we adopt now. It wasn't one of the things that was actually in the bill beforehand. Well, there, there was quite a lot of discussion around what's a home and what's not, and. I can even refer to my previous uh, supplementary order paper in the previous part, which, uh, which is trying to remove uh, the exemption for work that occurs in the home, uh, which is deemed to be resi um, yeah, residential. So, um, so, sir, I've got some questions around that. And I guess the other thing that worries me in this area, in this part, it also talks about offences. And again, we see the mishmash between employment law, contract law, and civil law. And there are some inequities that occur. For example, in this part, uh, uh, if there is uh, reckless conduct, for example, uh, then that would mean that uh, a person who was guilty of that under the Health and Safety and Employment Act would be liable for quite a large fine. Uh, but a maximum punishment of up to five years imprisonment. Something similar under the Crimes Act, criminal law, would get you up to 10 years in jail. So why is it okay to be reckless outside of the workplace? But if you're reckless in the workplace, you get, a, you get off a bit easier. And these are some of the inconsistencies, sir, that I struggle with, and I would, uh, I would <laughs> really appreciate some explanation for it. I agree with one of the previous speakers on this side of the house, who said that even though this is the uh, some very good parts and um, very good clauses in this part of the bill, it is undermined by the omissions in the first part, which is around worker representation and participation and the exclusions of who is covered by the bill and who isn't, particularly those in workplaces that have fewer than 20 workers that are deemed by some sort of magic magic process to be in high risk, <coughs> high risk industries, which of course, although we've had some suggestion about what they may be, 
we haven't got them sorted out yet. So, sir, I've got some questions. I'd be very grateful to the minister responding to them. We do like some of the clauses that he's put forward as SOPs, but I have to say, sir, 